for the Hoover Institution in Washington, D.C., quote, people say I'm a young man in a hurry. They're right, close quote. With us today on Uncommon Knowledge, the youngest member of the United States Senate, the new junior senator from Arkansas, Tom Cotton. Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Born just 37 years ago, Thomas Bryant Cotton grew up on a cattle farm in Dardanelle, Arkansas, population roughly 5,000. He graduated magna cum laude from Harvard, then received a JD from Harvard Law School. After practicing law for a couple of years to discharge his student debts, he joined the United States Army, and after completing a tour of combat duty in Iraq, he volunteered to go back and completed a tour of combat duty in Afghanistan. In 2006, Mr. Cotton came to public attention by writing an open letter to the New York Times, which he criticized for making public a secret program for monitoring terrorist finances. Quote, he wrote, you may think you have done a public service, but you have gravely endangered the lives of my soldiers. And by the way, Having graduated from Harvard Law, I am well versed in the espionage laws that you have plainly violated. By the time we return home, maybe you will be in your rightful place, not at the Pulitzer announcements, but behind bars." Close quote. After a stint with McKinsey, the management consulting firm, Mr. Cotton returned home to Arkansas. In 2012, he was elected to the United States Representatives, and just last year, he was elected to the United States Senate, where he serves on the Armed Forces Committee. Senator Tom Cotton, welcome. Thank you, Peter. Great to be on with you. The letter. You've endangered my soldiers. Your rightful place is behind bars. Now, I am assuming that out of simple fairness to you and all others who disagreed with what they had done, the New York Times published your letter. No, Peter, they did not. Uh, in fact, I think it first came to prominence on the internet, the Powerline blog. Right. Uh, I thought the New York Times might not publish it. Uh, so I also you copied- thought that, did you? I also, I also copied one or two more conservative friendly news outlets and uh, yeah, Powerline posted it and rocketed around their web pretty quickly. And it went viral. Still on that letter, regrets? You wrote that letter as a young man at war. Now you're a member of a body that calls for calm deliberation. Do you regret that the United States invaded Iraq? Do you regret your own combat tour in, in Iraq? Do you regret telling the editors of the New York Times that they ought to be behind bars? Any regrets? Peter, we, although we live in an open society and a democracy, uh, you have to have secrecy to protect our national security. And the editors or reporters at the New York Times, or for that matter, any media outlet, don't get to make decisions about which classified information they reveal and don't reveal. That's a decision that's entrusted to the people that Americans elect to lead us, the President of the United States and the members of the United States Congress. And that's what even the liberals on the Supreme Court said back in the Pentagon Papers case, said you can't have a prior restraint, but you do have to face the consequences of your decisions if you disclose classified information. And there's more than enough avenues for people who disagree with what is classified policy and action to take. They can go to an inspector general. They can go to a congressional oversight committee. There's various reporting techniques within the intelligence agencies. So no one that's a private citizen, whether they are someone like Edward Snowden or a reporter or producer or editor, has a right to disclose classified information just because they think it's in the national security interest. No regrets. No regrets about that, no. ISIS. From the Mideast in 2006, when you were fighting there, to the Mideast today, and the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria or ISIS. Question first, the pattern. Just a couple of months ago, ISIS controlled, at that point, roughly a third of Syria and maybe two-thirds of Iraq, large air elements of both countries. And every so often, every couple of weeks, they would release a tape showing them beheading a Western hostage. Now, there were other executions going, there were horrible things that were going on, but that didn't make the internet, so to speak. But it's a, once a week, once every couple of weeks. And then they shift from beheading hostages to burning alive a Jordanian pilot, someone they captured in uniform. And then most recently, they move from the region they control in Syria and Iraq to Libya, just across the Mediterranean from Italy, and they behead 21 Egyptians. So you've got an increase in pace. These events begin to be, happen more rapidly. 
and an increase in magnitude. You've got, frankly, it sound, look, feels to me as though you've got an escalation. Does this make you nervous? Are they trying to prepare us for an event in Europe or North America? Well, I think the Islamic State is a, a clear threat to America's national security interests. They're already cutting the heads off Americans, as you said, Peter. But we need to go back and think about why the Islamic State gained the territory they did and why they're on the offensive. Their precursor group is a group that I confronted in Iraq in 2006, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, that was a group that had infiltrated, that was largely responsible for a lot of the terrorist attacks on American troops and on Iraqi civilians in 2004, 5, 6. You asked if I had any regrets. I mean, one regret I would say about American policy in general is that it took three or four years to get the right strategy, which is what we had once the surge took effect in 2007 and 2008. So much so that by the time the president made the decision to withdraw all of our troops against the best judgment of his military commanders in 2011. When the current president. The current president, President Obama, made that decision in 2011. The deputy director of the CIA, former deputy director, Mike Morrell, has said Al-Qaeda in Iraq was defeated. In 2011, uh, these savages were defeated. Yet. We withdrew all of our troops. That eliminated a lot of the influence that we had over the Iraqi government. Nur al-Maliki, the prime minister at the time, reverted to sectarian ways, alienating a lot of the Sunnis uh, and some of the Kurds in the north. Also purged his military of most Sunni leadership, putting in Shiite cronies that supported him and his sects. And that allowed al-Qaeda in Iraq to regroup. The chaos in Syria gave them the territory they need, needed to expand, to recruit more radical Islamic terrorists and would-be terrorists from around the world, and then gave them a base of operations. And a lot of, a lot of that is, goes back to the President's decision in 2011 to withdraw from Iraq, as well as the President's decision in 2011 to largely stay on the sidelines in Syria, which then goes back, yep. to, which then goes back to the President's grand Iran strategy. There, there are very few questions about the Middle East today for which the answer is not Iran. Okay, let's get to Iran in just a moment, but back up to prior, well, a great deal of what anyone says about Iraq rests on his understanding of what happened after we invaded. So let me just get that question right out on the table. We invade in 2003, and for the first three weeks, things go, well, it, it wasn't easy for the men on the ground, of course, but things go very, very well. There's a rapid advance up from the south to the north of the country, and three weeks after we set boots in the ground, the regime of Saddam Hussein is gone. And then there's a period of really no fewer than four years, you could argue a little bit more, when things just went sideways. We lose over 3,000 men to death, hundreds of thousands of, well, that's very, very it's at least 100,000, as best I can tell from looking at the figures, at least 100,000 Iraqis are killed. And there's a period when the war, you could argue that it wasn't being lost, but you certainly could not argue that it was being won until the surge comes along. What went wrong during that period of drift when the war goes sideways? Well, what, what I saw in 2006 on the front lines right before the surge, and then what we saw at, this, at the macro level in 2007 and 2008, I think tells us what went wrong in that period, which is that we didn't have the right strategy and we didn't have enough troops on the ground to focus on the essential baseline, which is security. Security for the people that gives the space for the government to develop, for the political process to take hold, for the economy to grow. There was too, much, too little focus on providing that baseline security. There were some tactical decisions that were made that exacerbated the situation, for instance, largely dismissing all Sunni members of the security forces, the army, the right. intelligence, the police. You know, they were all, for the most part, members of the Ba'ath Party. That didn't mean that they were all Saddam loyalists. That meant that maybe if they wanted to advance as a professional in their society, they had to join that party, at least at the nominal level. Those are some tactical level decisions that were incorrect, I would say. But the main problem is that we didn't have enough troops and we didn't have the right strategy to focus on providing security. When I returned from Iraq in November of 2006, I can't say that I was very hopeful given what I had seen. I and all the other troops you know, at the front lines, the battalion level and below, knew that we needed more troops and they knew that we needed a new strategy. We just didn't know in the aftermath of the 2006 election with the Baker Hamilton Iraq study group report coming out if the president at the time, President Bush, would provide those troops. That's why I think that his decision to go with the surge will be recognized as his finest hour uh, because it really did turn the war around in Iraq and allowed us to get to where we could achieve victory if President Obama hadn't squandered those gains in 2011. Okay. Let's come back to the Mideast in a moment, but another event in the world at large is unfolding right now. Vladimir Putin and, and his advance into Ukraine. 
So we have in February, the United States says in effect to Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande, the president of France and the chancellor of Germany, you handle it. Go negotiate a ceasefire. The United States is monitoring it, but not playing an active role. And the Germans and the French do indeed negotiate a ceasefire. The trouble with a ceasefire is that they had just negotiated a ceasefire last September. And the Russians had violated that ceasefire in every particular. That ceasefire called for them to withdraw their heavy equipment, to withdraw Russian troops and advisors, and to stop offering support to Ukrainian rebels or separatists. In fact, they did everything they were not supposed to do, and now they're being given another ceasefire to consolidate their gains. I don't really think there's any other reasonable way of reading what took place. So what does a member of the Armed Services Committee of the United States Senate make of that? Well, the fundamental problem with the ceasefire is it didn't cease the fire. It it explicitly gave Russia and their uh, rebels in eastern Ukraine another 72 hours to continue to consolidate territory. And then the fundamental terms of it, too, were Ukraine would give more territory, pull back more of its heavy weapons, and grant autonomy to eastern Russia or eastern Ukraine, and Vladimir Putin would do nothing but promise to keep the promises he had made in September and broken in the meantime. But again, I think you have to return back to how we got to this situation in Ukraine. President Obama has a long pattern of accommodating and conciliating with implacable foes, whether it's Ayatollah Khamenei in Iran or Vladimir Putin in Russia and now the Castro brothers in Cuba. In the early days of this administration, President Obama pulled out missile defense systems from Poland and the Czech Republic. They had taken great risks to entertain with no concessions at all from Vladimir Putin. Then he started new nuclear negotiations with Russia, turning a blind eye to the continued violations of Russia's previous nuclear commitments. Again, as I said earlier, if there's a question about the Middle East, the answer is usually Iran. One reason why the president doesn't want to confront Russia, in my opinion, is because Russia is such an influential player in Syria and with Iran. So there's a long series of accommodation, I would say appeasement, that has encouraged Vladimir Putin to continue to take the action he's taken. Today, given where we are, we need to try to continue to support President Poroshenko, the new president of Ukraine, who is committed to reforms because Ukraine has a lot of problems in itself. But in the short term, we have to help the Ukrainian army defend itself from a Russian invasion. These are not guys running around with AK-47s anymore. It's Russian tanks. They need anti-tank rockets and missiles. They need anti-tank mines. They need communications equipment. They need night vision goggles. They need lots and lots of equipment that they're not currently getting if they're going to stop further Russian incursions. And how do you do that, Senator? How do you, uh, this is a question that I, I have a feeling we're going to ask two or three more times while we're talking. You're a member of the Armed Services Committee of the United States Senate. You and your chairman, John McCain, have direct responsibility in as much as the Senate itself has responsibility. You have direct responsibility for what you're talking about, weapon support, material support, intel support, and so forth. But the man who lives a few blocks from where we're taping this interview is going to remain in office for almost two more years. As a practical matter, what can a member of the United States Senate, even one who's already become as well liked as you have, even one the press has already figured out they'd better listen to because he gives great sound bites, even one who's already been honored with a seat on one of the most important committees, what can you do? Well, Peter, first off, I don't want it to make it sound partisan because I was at a press conference just a couple weeks ago with Jack Reed, who's the ranking Democrat Mm -hmm. on the Armed Services Committee, who also calls for arming Ukraine and several other Democrats on that committee. So there's a broad bipartisan agreement that we have to support Ukraine to defend our core national security interests. You have roughly half of the Democrats on the committee with you? Yes. Uh, And there's Democrats in the House of Representatives as well who realize this. That it's not just about Ukraine, for instance, that what Vladimir Putin has done in Ukraine, what he previously did in Georgia, he could try to do in Latvia or Estonia, NATO partners, if he wanted to test the resolve of NATO and show whether NATO truly was still a military alliance or just a paper tiger. So we have core interest here that many Democrats recognize. I think we should try to move forward with legislation promptly to force the president's hand. You're right that the president, any president, has great sway over our foreign policy, but Congress also has a large role as well. One example would be a few years ago when Congress passed Iran sanctions. President Obama and his administration fought tooth and nail against it. They now want to take credit for it, but they fought tooth and nail. They only accepted it when the Senate acted 99-0 to 
to uh, impose sanctions on Iran. So there is a role that the Congress can play in trying to defend America's interests. Because we, we, I, want, I want everyone to know, I want Americans to know, and I want our enemies and allies abroad to know that Obama's America is not America's future. That in 23 months there's going to be a new president, and people like me are still going to be around. People who take seriously defending our national interests, and who understand that the best way to avoid a war is to be prepared for war and willing to fight war. And the correct recourse is to legislation. Congress should do what Well, I mean, we can, we can do what we've been doing we now, which is hold hearings, do press conferences, try to generate more public support, because in the end, it's the American people who we want to win to our side and to bring pressure to bear on the president okay. to change his course. But we can also take legislative action. It takes a little bit longer, and hours and days matter in Ukraine right now. And that's why we're continuing to make the public case for arming Ukraine and helping Ukraine reform and consolidate authority within its government. But in the long term, sometimes legislation is necessary, just as it was with Iran sanctions. All right. Spending and what we get for it. President Obama has proposed a budget of $4 trillion. Astonishing. $4 trillion, including $612 billion for defense. Now, under President Reagan a quarter of a century ago, defense spending represented 27% of the federal budget. And now under President Obama, it's down to about 18% of the federal budget. On the other hand, during the Reagan years, the United States accounted for only about a third of the world's total defense spending. But under President Obama, the United States accounts for more than a third, about 37%. So how on earth, when these numbers are so vast, are you able to pursue your, really your fiduciary duty to make sure that taxpayers' money isn't being wasted? How do you decide how much is enough for defense? Well, Peter, first off, I have to correct an error in there that I wish were true. You said President Obama had proposed a $612 billion military budget. Yes. Actually, he's proposed $534 billion. Uh, at current levels, that's an increase over what w would be $498 billion. $612 billion is an important number, though. It comes from former Secretary of Defense Bob Gates' for, uh, budget from 2012. He said at that time that the baseline budget for 2016 could be no less than six, $612 billion. The recommendation of the National Defense Panel. Uh, I, just, I, I just put that in there to test, <laughs> to see if you're as good as Well, the National Defense Panel, though, <laughs> it, it's important to note, okay. is, a, is a group of respected bipartisan defense professionals. You have people like Michelle Flournoy, who was President Obama's Deputy Secretary of Defense, and Eric Edelman, who was President uh, George W. Bush's Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. They say unanimously that 612 billion should be the baseline. That is the absolute minimum. It probably should be more than that, but that is the absolute minimum and given the, the threats has we come, face. And president come in at, at five, 534 billion. 534 yes. billion. So I think we need to take the advice of the National Defense Panel and at a minimum, probably more, uh, spend $612 billion next year on our defense. Again, the best way to avoid a war is to be willing to fight it and be prepared to fight it. Okay. Most people think this president is not willing, but increasingly I worry that our military will not be prepared for a new president, and that's what the National Defense Panel says as well because of the radical cuts we've seen over the last Under years. Reagan, battle-ready ships in the United States Navy peaked at just under 600. Today we have fewer than 300. Now, the argument is that each of those 300 is so much technologically more sophisticated that you don't need as many as you might have needed in the old days. And the counter argument is nonsense when it comes right down to it. You have to have platforms at sea. Do we have enough ships to do what we need to do as China expands in the Pacific? There's a little truth on both points that you make. Um, but the basic truth is our Navy is not big enough. It's been being reduced to historic levels. Our Air Force is being reduced to historic levels. The Army is going to be as small as it was before World War II. So yes, technology changes and improves, and any single ship today is more effective than it was in the 1980s. But in the end, to project power around the world to ensure global order, not global disorder and chaos, which we've seen over the last uh, two years in particular, we need, need a Navy that can project power to any corner of the globe. Iran. <clears throat> in January, former Secretary of Defense Henry Kissinger testified before your committee, the Senate Armed Services Committee. Here's a quotation, longish quotation, but when Kissinger speaks, it's worth listening, even now. Nuclear talks with Iran began as an effort to, de to deny Iran the capability to develop a military nuclear option. They are now, the talks are now over the scope of that capability through an agreement that sets a hypothetical limit of one year on an assumed breakout. In other words, we're now negotiating with them and we've granted 
that it's fine with us if they set up the material and equipment and so forth so that they get to within one year of being able to make a nuclear weapon. Kissinger continues. The question then is what do the other countries in the region do? If the other countries conclude that America has approved the development of an enrichment capability within one year of a nuclear weapon, and if they insist on building the same capability, we will live in a proliferated world in which everybody will be very close to the trigger point. Close quote. Now, it can be argued that everything we've discussed right up until that could be turned around by the next president. It could be argued that it could be turned around quickly. We haven't discussed the economy much, but if you cut tax, there, there are people who believe, let us at least put, put it that way, that if you cut taxes and scale back regulation, the economy, the underlying economy is so buoyant, it can recover fast. We can build more ships. We can add more money to missile defenses. If Iran gets a nuclear weapon and Saudi Arabia decides it has to have one and Egypt decides it must have one, that cannot be undone by the next president. Senator? That's why a nuclear capable Iran is the gravest threat we face in the world today. It doesn't even have to get a nuclear weapon if it becomes an industrial nuclear state with a capability of building a weapon within a year or less and we'd have a checkered history on assessing the timelines for this kind of construction of a weapon of mass destruction, then what Secretary Kissinger predicts is correct. Countries like Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Turkey and the UAE are unlikely to let the Persian Shiite state of Iran be a nuclear threshold state without getting their own nuclear deterrent. And they don't even have to build it. Those countries are wealthy enough that they can procure it uh, from around the world. And you're right that it's very, very hard to impossible to roll that back. But we also have to step back and think about the president's overall strategy with Iran. From the very beginning, putting aside the most recent nuclear negotiations, he has made an effort to conciliate, to accommodate, and reach a historic rapprochement with the regime that is still the number one state sponsor of terrorism, that for 35 years has been chanting death to America, death to the great Satan, that is fundamentally hostile to our interest everywhere in the world. And they, they already do that. Think what they would do if they had a nuclear umbrella. And think what would happen if the, nuclear, if the Middle East became a uh, uh, system of states, all of which had nuclear weapons or had nuclear threshold powers. A lot of those states have their own threats uh, from Sunni jihadist groups. If one of those groups were able to seize control of the country like they did in uh, Yemen, or like a Shiite group, the Houthis, supported by Iran, recently did in Yemen, if Yemen had had nuclear weapons. So that's one reason why a nuclear Iran is such a grave threat to America and why the president's series of accommodations uh, with Iran is, in my opinion, so grievously mistaken. Okay, so he still has more than two years to run in office. And what I sense, I was about to say in this town, but elsewhere in the country, right up until Right up until this year, right up until you and your colleagues took office and Republicans found themselves in control of both houses of, of Congress up on the Hill, right up until then, people were willing to point out Obama's shortcomings, point out that he was making mistake after mistake in foreign policy, but it was fundamentally, as I read it, the premise that the people who disagreed with President Obama were laying the predicate for a next administration. And now something has shifted. Now the, there begins to be the feeling that that's not going to be good enough. He has, more, he has almost two years left in office. If he achieves an agreement with Iran, he may do, do something that cannot be undone. And so, for example, we have the former mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, just, it seems to me, <clears throat> I've met the man a little bit, it seems to me as though he just lost his patience. And he just bubbled over and said, he's. he's He's not protecting the American people. That's the first job of a leader, to protect the American people. Now, in today's New York Times, I beg your pardon, in today's Wall Street Journal, Rudy Giuliani has a piece, I don't know if you've had a chance to read it yet, in which he said, look, I lost my, he says, in effect, I lost my temper, but I had an argument. So there's a frustration. There's still two more years to go. Legislation may, do you and your colleagues feel this frustration? What do you, if he gets closer and closer to, an agreement with Iran, what do you do? No, there is a deep what frustration. Do do? That's why uh, the Senate Banking Committee, on which I also sit, 
uh, last month passed new sanctions legislation out of our committee. And while in late March, if the president reaches a deal that we don't view as acceptable or tries to extend past the next deadline, I suspect the Senate will take it up and it will get broad bipartisan support, as the original sanctions legislation did just a few years ago. The Armed Services Committee just passed out of committee bills that would put further constraints on the president's ability to transfer terrorists out of Guantanamo Bay to other countries because we have seen so many of these terrorists go back onto the battlefield. And that's an immediate risk, as you say. It's not something that we can right. wait 23 years to do, or 23 months to do. So the, the Congress, in a bipartisan fashion, reflects that deep frustration that Americans see that the president simply is not taking the actions necessary to keep America safe. Okay, two or three points, if I may, Senator, which may come up during your first year as the new junior senator from Arkansas. There could be a, a moment for constructive national debate. And moment number one might be, he is going to request an authorization for the use of military force, AUMF, because there cannot be too many acronyms in Washington. And as his authorization stands, it is going to request the Congress of the United States to bind him and apparently his successors. I only want this to be valid for three years. I wanted to exclude the use of troops on the ground. So it's a kind of, instead of the old-fashioned notion, declaration of war, you're the commander-in-chief, go do what you need to do. This is, bind me. Tie one hand behind my back. So, are you going to give that to him? We, you said, as the president has called it, uh, that he submitted an authorization for the use of military force, right. an AUMF. AUMF. I would call it an RUMF, a restriction on the use of military force. In almost unprecedented fashion, this president is asking the Congress to put constraints on him, but I would say more importantly, constraints on the next president. Right. So as I've said, the world needs to know, enemy and ally alike, that Obama's America is not America's future. He's trying to make it our future because I believe whoever is our next president, either party will be more hawkish on national security matters than this president has been. So, the president, and the president has said already, and I agree with them, that he has more than enough legal authority under the Constitution and the 2001 and 2002 use of force resolutions to execute his strategy against the Islamic State. I would be supportive of passing another resolution or amending one of those resolutions to simply say the president may use all necessary and appropriate force to that's destroy okay, the Islamic a, State. Richard, Richard, I, would, I would not support, at least not without getting an up or down vote on that kind of unconditional resolution, any kind of resolution that has a time limitation or tries to tie our commander's hands and what kind of forces they can or cannot use. Look, the Islamic State is cutting the heads off Americans and burning pilots alive. They're not taking options off the table. We shouldn't be taking any options off the table either. So is there any, Richard Epstein, my, fellow, my colleague at the Hoover Institution, who writes for Ricochet, and he wrote a piece last week, as I recall, a constitutional lawyer saying, no need for a president to sign a resolution. Give him a, pass a declaration of war. Send him a clean resolution. Ignore this cockamamie AUMF he sent up and send him a clean resolution. Is there any thought among the leadership that you might do just that? Well, I think there's a lot of Republicans who want, they want to send a simple use of force resolution. Okay. One sentence that just says the president is authorized to use the necessary and appropriate force to destroy the Islamic State. Okay. Uh, he comes up with an agreement with Iran. Does that have to go before the Senate? Is it going to be treated as a treaty? Uh, well, he's given every indication that he doesn't want to he submit doesn't to a want congressional it, and You've vote. already got at least one Democrat and, on your side, Bob Menendez of New Jersey, saying, no, 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 no. So, so where does well, that the, stand in I the I mean, the Congress, the Congress has voted in the past on civilian nuclear deals with countries like right. India and Canada. So I find it astonishing that the president wouldn't have a vote for a... Um, a nuclear deal that involves nuclear weapons with a country like Iran, an implacable foe. If he doesn't submit it for a vote, it's important the American people know, it's even more important that men like Ayatollah Khamenei and Hassan Rouhani and Qasem Soleimani know that that is a 23-month deal. And in January of 2017, it has an expiration date. And they may want to factor that into their negotiations right now. Okay. A few questions about Tom Cotton. <laughs> Quotation one from your, two quotations, from your Harvard undergraduate thesis, quote, ambition characterizes and distinguishes national office holders from other kinds of human beings. This ensures a superior intelligence compared to the unambitious, close quote. Quotation two from your remarks when you announced your candidacy for the Senate, quote, politicians in Washington boss you around and act like they're better than you. Close quote. Now, how do you fit those two together? Well, too many politicians in Washington do boss you around and act like they're your betters. Because you hope 
You hope that the people we elect to govern us are wise and prudent and courageous, but that doesn't mean that they know everything or that they can come to a better solution than the American people can for themselves on so many matters. I mean, this is classic Hayek and Friedman. No matter how smart, no matter how smart the people we elect to any government, to our federal government, state government, or local governments, they're not as smart on so many matters as the collective wisdom of the people making choices for in their day-to-day -day lives about the kind of jobs they want to hold, the kind of education they want their children to have, the ways they want to spend their money, the ways they want to spend their retirement, and so forth. So we hope that we always elevate leaders like a Ronald Reagan or Abraham Lincoln or Winston Churchill. We hope that we get those kind of leaders. We don't always, and my thesis, which was a defense of the Federalist and its defense of the Constitution, so that our Constitution is the best designed system of government in human history that is going to try to ensure that we elect people who are wise and prudent and courageous. But sometimes we don't, and at all times, great leaders like Ronald Reagan would know that he's not smart enough to control this country from the middle, that he wants to empower Americans to lead their own lives. He wants to give them the tools like a secure environment in a world that's characterized by order, not disorder, and control over their day-to-day -day choices to let them flourish, which means America will flourish. A couple last questions. Your sense of the Senate, what is it like? And I have two questions. One is, how collegial is it turning out to be? Would, uh, on one argument that would strike me personally as a very hopeful argument, there is a new generation of members of the United States Senate, and they are unamb un unabashedly conservative. You, Barrasso, Cruz, Lee, Sass of Nebraska, the Senate could be the place, maybe for the first time in a century, the Senate could be the place where debate really is interesting, where policy really does get fleshed out. But only if you guys talk to each other and cut a few deals and, and agree to, a, to present a, a, to some extent a united front. And it's hard to see that that has happened in recent years among, on the Republican side. And maybe being in the majority makes a big difference. How, what's your sense of how it's going to play out? Well, I mean, I'd say you guys my, play well in, with each in other. My two months in the Senate, yeah, we play well with each other. I've had very good collegial relations with the Democrats. I've gotten to know oftentimes because I serve on the same committee with them. Even though we know that on things like, say, tax policy or regulatory policy, we have deep and fundamental disagreements. So I found in the Senate, but also in my last two years in the House, mm -hmm. that you know I have a perfectly good relationship with most of the Democrats, even very liberal Democrats. And we just recognize that we're going to have to agree to disagree on a lot of matters, but there are some areas of concern on different members with different policies where we can work together in the best interest of our country. Interesting. All right. Last question about the nature of the Senate, the way in your <clears throat> deep experience having sat in the body for two months. On the one hand, as I read the situation, on the one hand, you've got the Republican majority saying, we have a difficult piece of work ahead of us just making this institution run in a reasonable and constitutional fashion. Harry Reid ran it like a dictatorial body. We want the Senate of the United States to go back to being a great deliberative body once again. And it, so far as I can tell, Leader McConnell is as good as his word, but S1, getting the Keystone Pipeline legislation approved, took two weeks of fighting on the, that's out of committee, that's two weeks on the floor and I may have the number a little bit wrong, but I believe it was 41 different amendments, 41 amendments. I, nay, I, nay, 41 times. So on the one hand, just getting this institution back to good working order looks as though it's quite an absorbing task. And on the other, as you and I have just been discussing, there's a sense of growing crisis in this town that, frankly, the president is going in the wrong direction, that whereas right up until now he's been doing things that his opponents could live with, that could be undone. He may now be about to do things that cannot be undone. So you've got the Senate of the United States trying to teach, it's, it's like rehab, it's trying to learn how to tie shoelaces again when issues of immense moment are breaking upon it. How do you, how do well, you, how do you do Harry your job? Reed, Harry Reid did run the Senate in an unprecedented fashion for the last four years, but I would say he did it uh, at the behest of Barack Obama. They had temporary, illusory supermajorities in 2009 and 2010. They passed laws like the stimulus 
and Obamacare. And then at that point, when in 2010, when the Republicans took over the House, I think Barack Obama just told Harry Reid, I don't want to have to deal with Congress. Let me implement all these great laws through the bureaucracy. So it was Democrats who were stymied as much as Republicans under Harry Reid. And what you called rehab, I might compare to spring training in baseball. All right. A lot of Democrats... Sounds, sounds much healthier. Sounds well, a lot of, I like a lot it better. Of, a lot of Democrats in January when we were debating the Keystone Pipeline bill uh, were surprised that they were off, able to offer an amendment. Brian Schatz, you know, a strong, fervent believer in man-made climate change who wants to fundamentally change the way our economy works to counteract uh, his beliefs in climate change was able to offer an amendment. And a lot of people were surprised that Mitch McConnell allowed that. So I, I think like a baseball player gets back to spring training and gets in midseason form and then things move more smoothly. You'll see over time in the Senate, even in the coming weeks, that people realize now that Senator McConnell is rightly committed to making the Senate a deliberative legislative body again, even if that means that some of, some of his Republican senators have to take tough votes. And I think that's a good thing because that's what the American people sent us here to do is to, to vote on legislation and settle our differences and then move on. And that's what you couldn't do under Harry Reid. Okay, Tom Cotton, for a man as young as you still are, you have turned down a remarkable number of careers. <laughs> as best I can tell, everybody loved you in the United States Army. You could have a couple stars on your shoulder by now. And, and <laughs> Hardly. And, well, I'd probably be out of the Army <laughs> given the military cuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, at least it was a possibility. For sure, Harvard, Harvard, Harvard undergrad, Harvard Law, you could be do making big bucks in some law firm right here in this town or even bigger bucks up in New York. And for sure, you could have stayed with McKinsey and done management consulting and after two or three years of that, gone off and started your own company in Silicon Valley. By the standards of the country, the pay of a United States Senator is pretty good. But by the standards of the golden roads down which you took a few steps, and then turned around and came back, it's okay at best. And you're about to have your first child. What are you doing in politics? What are you doing in politics? You know, I, I have had some twists and turns in my life. Or should I ask your wife? Life. No, no, I, I've had some twists and turns in my life. Um, you know, I was in my last year in law school when the 9-11 attacks happened, and that's what made me want to go serve and fight in defense of our country. And I can tell you that of all the jobs I've had, no matter what the paycheck was, Nothing was as rewarding as being a platoon leader with 41 infantrymen in Iraq because I was there living out my deep passion, providing leadership for my platoon, and fighting the cause that I thought was just and noble. Um, so it's not to me so much about what I'm being paid to do, but about the service I'm able to render to my country and to others. And I think it's a great privilege and an honor to be able to serve in the United States Senate, a special place for a state like Arkansas, which is small because we have an equal voice with large states like California and Texas, and to once again be able to serve in a different capacity. Um, you know, I was able to serve as a, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, and now being able to serve my state and my country in the Senate you know, is a great honor. Last question. Your child is due in about a month. When that baby is 10 years old, not when the baby is as old as you are, or not when that baby is 80, just 10 years from now, how concretely would you like to see this country look different? I'd like to see us once again be the most respected or the most feared power all around the world. America has been a force for good in the world for as long as we've existed as a country. And I think unfortunately right now, our enemies don't fear us, our allies are nervous about our commitments, uh, and our ability to protect our interests all around the world are declining. We've got a lot of problems in America. You know, we still have too many people out of work or who aren't getting the wages that they need to support their families. We have a large budget deficit that's gonna to continue to get larger, but when you, compare, when you compare America to the rest of the world, we still are, uh, as Lincoln said, the last best hope for freedom on earth. Or as Ronald Reagan said, a shining city upon a hill. But we have to be willing to defend our interests and defend our principles all around the world in a way that frankly I don't think we've done for the last six years. And that's something to which I'm strongly committed in the United States Senate to doing for my own child and for the children that are gonna meet, be in America's next generation. Tom Cotton, Jr., Senator from the state of Arkansas, thank you. Thank you, Peter. For the Wall Street Journal and the Hoover Institution, I'm Peter Robinson.